you have heard the one about the man who was shipwrecked alone on a desert island. After many years of struggling to survive alone, he was finally discovered by a search party of rescuers. But before he went back to the ship, he said, first let me show you the three little buildings I built on this island for myself. Here's my house, and here's my church. And the rescuer said, well, what about that third building? Oh, he said, I don't want to talk about that one. That's the church I used to go to before I got mad and built the other one. Today on this Rally Sunday, as we all gather together, the Gospel lesson tells us about how we are not made to be solitary castaways, but the blessing, instead of being together in a church community, of how Christ promises to be with us wherever two or three or more are gathered. And about the love we know in Him and are able to share with each other. But the Gospel also recognizes today that wherever two or more humans are gathered together, we will inevitably step on each other's toes and hurt one another. And so how to do the hard, important work of asking for forgiveness and giving it to the other people in our lives. Human beings, Genesis tells us, were created in the image of God. Let us make man in our image, God said. And so we are created to be like God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're created to be as a part of a community, as a we, as an us, as a plural. It's not good for the man to be alone, God said. And so he made us for each other and gave us to each other. To be husband and wife, parent and child, family, friends to each other, children of God together. We are made to be together and to be gathered together in a community. The worst punishment we have invented in our world, uh, for the living at least, is solitary confinement. And the greatest heartache we face in this life is to be totally alone and totally disconnected and separated from other people. Our family was in New York a couple weeks ago, riding the subway, with everyone else looking at their phones in silence, earbuds in their ears, refusing to glance at everyone or anyone else, that kind of, you know, New York subway etiquette. And yet the ironic thing is, everyone from my uh, eavesdropping seemed to be looking at Facebook. And that's kind of how we can get trapped in loneliness, trapped in ourselves, but somehow longing to connect to other people. God has made us for each other, made us to be gathered together in His name. And yet, wherever two or three are gathered, one will appoint himself chairman, and one will be secretary, and both will lord it over the third one. Anytime you're dealing with human beings, even Christian ones, the old sinner in each of us gets to work telling other people what they need to do and coming up with plenty of reasons why that does not apply to me in my case. Sound familiar? Feelings get hurt, feathers get ruffled, misunderstanding snowball, self-righteousness and self-importance rear their ugly heads, and real sins are committed against each other, and we like it. The light has come into the world, and we like the darkness better. So today Jesus gives us sort of a blueprint of how to sort out our disagreements, both in the church, but also in any kind of relationship where we're dealing with other people. Jesus says, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. When the two of you are alone, go and point out the fault to them. Now usually we do the exact opposite, don't we? If we have a problem with someone, we don't go directly to them in private. Instead, we go directly to someone else and we go invest their sin with them and start collecting interest on it. I can't believe they did that to me. Can you? It's easier to complain to someone else, to what's called triangulate somebody else against that other person or in typical German fashion, it's easier just to never talk or look at the person who sinned against us ever again. It's much easier than 
to go privately, to go in humility, to give that person a chance, to bring it up to them directly, speaking the truth in love, and see if somehow it can be worked out. We know that most disagreements are never about the issue at hand, but about how we communicate about it. So work it out, Jesus says. And if you can, then you've regained a brother. Then you have that sister back. And if not, there are subsequent steps for involving some witnesses and finally the whole church. But the point of it all is to regain each other as brothers and sisters. Because that is Jesus' focus on restoring relationships that we so easily break. On restoring sinners like you and me to the whole community. On restoring us to relationship with each other. Jesus rules his kingdom and builds it on the forgiveness of our sins. And whatever you loose on earth, whatever you forgive on earth, will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you and I can forgive here, God will forgive also. There's a story about a woman named Corrie Ten Boom who lived in Holland in the Netherlands during World War II. She was a Christian and she hid many Jews in a secret hiding place in her house until she was arrested for it and sent with the Jews to a camp. And there her family died and there because of a clerical error she was accidentally released and set free. So after the war she spent her time speaking about forgiveness and how there is no future in marriage and friendships and relationships, no future for the church, no future for the world without the forgiveness that comes from Christ, without the forgiveness that we can offer to each other. And she said, one day after I was giving a talk about forgiveness in front of all these people, a man came up to talk to me and I recognized him instantly. He was one of the guards from my prison camp. He didn't recognize me, but he came up and said that he had done some bad things during the war, things he felt guilty about. But he had become a Christian, he had asked God for forgiveness, but he wanted to hear from her own lips that he was forgiven. This woman, who was a professional speaker about forgiveness, said, I could not find any forgiveness in me for him. I could not do it. I refused. I said nothing. I bit my tongue. I did nothing. And as we think about those places in our lives where we've suffered hurt, those places that are so tender, those places of betrayal, I think we can all relate. No, you don't deserve it. I'm not forgiving you. But then she said, I knew that forgiveness doesn't come from us. And I knew that it's not really about us. And I knew it's much more than whatever we feel or don't feel inside. And I knew that Christ taught us to pray saying, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And I knew that unforgiveness in our hearts is like eating rat poison yourself and then watching and waiting for the rats to die. And so she said, she willed her arm to go out and to take his hand and to shake it. And then she mouthed the words without meaning it at all, saying, you are forgiven. And in that moment, she said, I felt such electricity in my hands. I felt such loving power flow through me. I never understood the depths of God's forgiving love until that moment. That's the love that we know on the cross. Our Lord who hung there between two guilty criminals who had sinned. And there Jesus was rejected and mocked and abandoned. And he died there for your trespasses and for mine. But what did he say? Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
Jesus asks the Father to forgive you and me. He does not hold what we have done or left undone against us, but overcomes our past and opens our future with his own precious blood. For his love refuses to let our sin prevail. His love, not even death, can conquer. His love at work in our lives fulfills the law for how we need to treat one another, love one another, for love is the fulfilling of the law. That's all we owe to each other. And to pour out that love into your life, Jesus rose again on the third day in power and in glory and promises you if you want this love at work in you, if you want it to flow into your deepest wounds and to flow out to others like electricity, well, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there right with you. We know that clubs usually require a quorum of 50% of their members to be present to do anything. We know that still our brothers in Judaism require 10 men to be in the room to begin their prayers. Well, Jesus says, if there's two of you hmm, at home, around the table, in the church, of any gender or age or race or language, if you're gathered together in my name, I'm right there with you already. Even when you're at your worst, even when you're not sure what you're asking for, even when it seems like the past is too heavy upon you and the future too uncertain, Jesus promises, I am right there with you. I am right there to share my forgiving love with your life. He is right here. As we have gathered together this morning, he is right here as in a moment we'll share his peace as we drink together from the one cup shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. He is right here among us pouring his forgiving love out into us so that it might flow out into our relationships, into our families, into our workplaces, into this church that in forgiving and receiving forgiveness we might know more than ever the forgiving love he gives us from his cross. For look around. We were made for each other. And wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.